Welcome everyone to the final week of Lenten lunches. Uh, we've been on a journey here, walking through different readings, um, taking 20 minutes at our lunchtime to just kind of think and dwell on the journey of Lent. So it's been great having you guys with me. I've appreciated all the feedback and uh, yeah, I, I hope this has been been good for you as it has been for me. So as always, we are going to begin with a reading from Henry J. Na J. M. Nowen, who was a worked with the Lalash or La Arch community um, for the disabled at the latter half of his life, and was just a, a, an amazing person and an author. So this is what he writes for us today on April seventeenth. Um, the title of his reflection is. Jesus makes our deepest self known. So this is what he writes. Our heart is at the center of our human being. There our deepest thoughts, intuitions, emotions, and decisions find their source. But it's also there that we are often most alienated from ourselves. We know little or nothing of our own heart. We keep our distance as though we were afraid of it. What is most intimate is also what frightens us the most. Where we are most ourselves, we are often strangers to ourselves. That is the painful part of our human being, of being human. We fail to know our hidden center. And so we live and die often without knowing who we really are. If we ask ourselves why we think, feel, and act in such and such a way, we often have no answer, and thus proving to be strangers in our own house. The mystery of the spiritual life is that Jesus desires to meet us in the seclusion of our own heart to make his love known to us there, to free us from our fears, and to make our deepest self known to us in the privacy of our heart. Therefore, we can learn not only to know Jesus, but through Jesus, we may know ourselves as well. Henry Nouwen. So, we will now move to our scripture reading from today, and it's a lengthy one. Um, this is the reading, reading taken from the Revised Com Common Lectionary uh, for Good Friday. So, we're, we're jumping ahead a couple days, um, but this is taken from, sorry, uh, from Psalm 22. So, here we go. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, I find no rest. Yet you are the one, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved, and in you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open, their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, 
and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cries for help. Psalm 22, verses 1 to 24. There's no single verse in all of scripture that causes us to stop and reflect at the sheer wonder of the statement than the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are the most mysterious, beautiful, and profoundly revelatory words found in scripture. They are words that have their first appearance here in Psalm 22. They are the opening verse. And here the psalmist cries out to God, feeling as one forsaken by God. The psalmist cries out day and night as one who is in anguish, who feels that God is far from delivering him from his enemies. Dogs surround him. A pack of villains encircle him. They have pierced his hands and feet. All his bones are on display. The people are staring and gloating over him. Without knowing it, David, the author of this psalm, is writing prophetically of Jesus. Jesus knows this and quotes this psalm 22 from the cross. We read in, in Mark 15 that at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, laba sabachthani, which means, God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this actually adds a whole new depth of meaning to know what the psalm is to us. To know that it is God in the flesh who is crying out in forsakenness to God. Why? Why does Jesus cry out in forsakenness to God? Or to put it another way, why does God cry out to God in forsakenness? The full answer, I believe, to this question will always elude us as we are humans trying to understand the unfathomable mystery that is God is Trinity. Let me suggest that we dare not say something as foolish as the father turned his face away. Here in the psalm we just read, it, it rebukes this understanding. In verse 24, for he has not despised or, or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him. Verse 24. We should know that at no point on the cross does Jesus cease to be fully God and fully in communion with the Father. But we, we might dare say a few things about what is happening here in this psalm and, and more importantly for our Lenten journey, what is happening in the words of Christ. We might dare to say that Christ's cry of dereliction is the proclamation that God knows suffering. Jesus' words become an identification for all who have felt forsaken. These words capture the terror and ugly horror of this fallen world under the reign of death. These words say God fully knows our feelings in our suffering, our pain, and our despair. Yes, Jesus, the one who is God incarnate, knows our pain. He knows what it feels like to be abandoned. 
We might also dare to say in this passage that this is the length God will go to save us. Jesus on the cross is entering into the antithesis of God's nature by emptying himself. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 2, the famous Christ hymn, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus on the cross is experiencing the alienation that sinners experience when they when they enter into death, as Romans 6 says. Jesus assumes and absorbs himself all the iniquity, all the sin, all the suffering and fallenness of this world into himself. He fully experiences the privation of good, the suffering and the ceasing to exist that the power of death inflicts on our human bodies. Jesus here is entering into death's door. The cry of Christ's dereliction, that dereliction cry, is the cry of Jesus experiencing all that is alien to God's nature. The infinite God confronting a finite death. It is the horror of the eternal God in Christ entering the mortal finitude of death. This is the cry of co-suffering love. As Isaiah 53 says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. And this reveals the height, the depth, the length of just how far we'll go. God will go to save us. Here at the cross, God in Christ refuses to let our sin determine our relationship to him. And so God in Christ enters our human condition, including our pain, our forsakenness, and our suffering. And he does this to heal our human condition from the inside. As Gregory of Nazianus once said, what Christ assumes, he heals. And that's what Jesus is doing on the cross. Okay. Let's move on to our prayer, and then I will bless you guys to go uh, and, um, yeah, experience Good Friday, um, which I'll talk about at the end here. So here we go into our prayer section. And as always, I'll show the image, I'll read the prayer, and I'll just pause, and I'll let you contemplate that. May the urgency with which I approach my work, never become anxiety. The world is not mine to save. May my good works be fruits of my life rather than justification of it. May I never consider my weaknesses and faults the larger or most authentic parts of me. May I have the freedom to fail even at things I care about knowing that mistakes aren't the end of my process, but they're part of it. Though I know I'm influenced by my past, May it never rule me or define who I am entirely. May it be enough for me to see God 
in the world. Okay, that is our journey through Lenten lunches. Uh, thank you for joining me these last seven weeks. So I want to just briefly uh, remind you that we do have some some Holy Week services coming up. So on Friday, we have a Good Friday service at 9 a.m. and at 11 a.m. with child care being provided at the 11. And on Resurrection Sunday, uh, we have three services, one at 8.30 one at 10 and one at 11.30. So I encourage you to uh, to make your way up to those and, and really live into this upcoming week. This is such an opportunity that is provided to us to, to, to think again afresh what Jesus has done for us. So uh, blessings um, and may God be with you this week. Take care.